For our remaining time together, I'm going to be going through my 25 rules for fundraising. You have them in your packets. If you want to look along, that's great. Don't read ahead. <laughs> but you don't have to. Um, you don't need to. Um, and also, as you, ask questions or, as you have questions or comments throughout, please ask them as we go along. Because I know some of you have questions, because some of you asked me questions at the break. And the group would really benefit from hearing your questions. So please feel free to ask as we go along. Okay, rule one is the rule we've been talking about for the last hour and a half. Um, I promise the next 24 will go faster. Um, but you can't, just to review, you cannot do fundraising until you've really thought through your art, created wonderful programming, created wonderful marketing, both programmatic and institutional, attracted people who care about your work and want to somehow be involved with your work. That's when fundraising starts. And if you try and do it first, you're trying to do what I call brute force fundraising. And brute force fundraising is when you just, you have to give, you have to give, you have to give. It just doesn't work. And it certainly doesn't work in the long term. This, this approach gets people wanting to give you money rather than you're forcing them to give you money. Rule two, fundraising is not begging. It really isn't begging. I know fundraising's hard in England in part because this discussion of money is something very hard to get over and this, there's like this hump to cross in this country. And you, know, you don't talk about income, you don't talk about wealth, one just want to talk about giving money. Money isn't something that's so comfortable to be discussed. But that's something you have to get over a little bit to do good fundraising. But it's so much easier when it's not begging, when it's not give me money, give me money, but I have something to offer you, you have something to offer me, let's figure this out together. Number three, always have a menu of projects to, to think about when you see a donor. Don't come with just one project. If you come with only one project and the first thing they say is, I'm not interested, then the meeting's over. And we never want to waste a meeting with a donor. We want to have a conversation. You haven't gotten enough information if all you get out of it is no. So come with a menu. Come with a slate of ideas. And think about that ahead of time. What are the various things I might want to talk about? I have my menu of projects so firmly ingrained in my head because I think about this literally every day. I don't take a lot of time at it, meaning I don't sit down for four hours to work on this. But it's always on my brain. I'm constantly making changes, thinking things through. I'm constantly thinking through my artistic set of projects. Because to the public, this is my mission. We can have the fanciest statement in the world that we want to bring dance to the world and beauty of Asian arts to blah, blah, blah. But to the public, this is what they see your mission. This is the way the rubber hits the road. So to me, I am constantly have this on my mind. So when I sit down with any donor, this can pop out. And by the way, not just when I sit with them for money, but just when I'm sitting down and talking about the world. Because a lot of my time is spent talking to people about art and not talking about money. I find if fundraisers only talk about money when people see them, they will run. If every time you see a donor is only to ask them for their gift, then when they see your name come up on their cell phone, they're not going to answer the phone. It's just like if you have a brother or a friend who only calls you when they want money, you ignore them. We do that as fundraisers. Fundraisers should be spending a lot of time talking about this and very little time talking about this. I meet with my major donors once a year, and we have a business meeting to cover the whole year. We talk about all the things they might want to participate in, the subscription tickets or their gift or the galas or whatever. We come up with one agreement, that's it. And the rest of the 11 months, all I talk about with them is money, is, is, is art. Excuse me, <laughs> not <money>. art. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Take that off the film. Um, <laughs> but this has to be the topic of conversation. Therefore, the key to good fundraising is listening and not always speaking. It's understanding what the donor's interests are and then taking the time to respond with what would make sense for that donor rather than just going on and yammering about your next project because you're so nervous. Believe me, I know how much fear is in this room. I know how much fear there is in our field. This is a universal sense of, oh my goodness, where's the money going to come from? Oh my goodness, are we going bankrupt? We want to do this project. Are we going to have the resource? That's the nature of being an arts manager. But we don't solve that by venting to the donor. 
or frankly venting to the board member or anyone else. That's unfortunately something we have to do at home. We, we have to go home and cry and hit the wall and whatever it is, but publicly we have to be excited about the work we're doing. Okay, suppose I came up to you, because you're an experienced fundraiser, now you're reading ahead, but suppose I came up to you <laughs> and said, and, and I'm the, the um, donor and you're the fundraiser, which you are, and I'm telling you what I'm interested in, and you have nothing to match my interests. Nothing I'm saying can you even address. What would you say to me? I would simply talk about what you're interested in. If we haven't got anything that matches, and I would have the list right. going so in my head, um, I wouldn't suggest anything. Yeah. And if they specifically, we'd, we'd set up a conversation that was about what they might give to, I would say, I don't think it works Absolutely. at the moment. Thank you. That's exactly the right answer. If the only <laughs> thing, if someone says to you, I care only about Swedish architecture, and all you're working on is kabuki theater. <laughs> Don't try and say, well, you know, there are Swedes <laughs> in Japan and they have been in a building, so that's where you should fund us. It's like when you go into a clothing shop and you put on a shirt that's too big and the salesperson is holding it behind you, you know, <laughs> to try and make it seem like it fits. We do that too often in fundraising. It, the best thing to do if you don't have a project is to say so. Say, I really don't think we're the right match right now, but I'd like to come back sometime if I ever think we have the right project. You sound so mature. You sound so reasonable. You know, one of the biggest reasons why people will fund one organization or not another is because they believe the organization is being run in a smart way. They trust their money with it. They believe it's being run maturely. And they believe that if they work with that organization, they're going to really be treated professionally and properly. And the worst thing we can do is to hurt a relationship by, by trying to wheedle and trying to connive and manipulate into getting a one-time gift. My approach to fundraising is all about the long term. It's all about how do I work someone up over time? How do I get them so in, in tune with us and so excited by us that they want to give more and more, rather than how do I get the quick money and run from them? I have a donor, she's one of my biggest donors and one of my favorite donors, and 12 years ago she was giving $50 a year. Of her own volition, she was a member of the Kennedy Center for $50 and she got the benefits of the $50 membership. Lovely, fine. Um, then she, on her own volition, over time decided to upgrade from her $50 gift to a $500 gift. And because you got more benefits and she decided she wanted to do that. And I believe in groups of donors. I love bringing donors together in groups. I like them talking to each other. I think they reinforce their love of us. And also, I love for them to manage the process of getting more donors. Those of you who talked about being in smaller organizations without a lot of time for fundraising, the best thing to do is to let fundra funders manage fundraising, at particularly at the lower levels. Let them do events, let them do things to get more funders. And I love deals. How many of you have a membership scheme? 20 pounds, 50 pounds a year, a lot of you do. How much is your membership to be a member, the lowest level member? Uh, it depends on, on their, their organization. So so I see it. Okay, and how many members do you have? Uh, 3,000. 3, it's great, it's a great number. Um, the way I get up to 3,000 for those, and I'm sure some, many of you have less than 3,000, <laughs> is give everyone a deal, you get 50% off next year's membership if you bring me a member. The cheapest way to add to your membership base is just to say, if you bring me a new member, you get half off your membership. And just keep doing that, and your membership will keep growing. Anyone who brings you a member gets half off. And over time, it just keeps growing. That's how we got the 26,000 at Covent Garden in a relatively short time. So back to my friend who went up from the 50 to the 500. She got on one of these committees, and one of the ways we get these committees feeling like they want to be in the committee is that I would talk to them twice a year about the art we're going to do. This is what their real payoff was. They loved hearing about this. We're doing this, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. 
So I was talking about a project we were going to do. It was a theater, big theater project at the musicals of Stephen Sondheim. This person came up to me afterwards and said, I love Stephen Sondheim. I'm so excited you're doing this project. I'm going to give you 500 for it. <laughs> so I'm going, okay, she's giving me 500, and now she's going to give me another 500. That's good news, double, fund, you know, double the gift. And the check came in for $500,000. <laughs> no one knew she was rich. She just looked like an everyday person. And she is now gives me more than that every year. We built this relationship with her over a period of time. Every time we promised her something, we delivered. We don't talk about money with her very much at all. In fact, I hate doing it because we've now become, I won't say we'll be from friends, but we become from friends because we talk about art so much and we go through this time together and she feels so tied into who we are. That's good fundraising. So it's not about the discussion of money. It's about how do you bring someone in to feel that their personal happiness is tied up in the success of your organization. She is not happy if we're not doing well. So really, really think about that. And saying no to someone, saying, no, I don't have a project right now. No, we're not doing anything that's in your interest area is one wonderful way to start to build that trust that adds to the big gift. Not everyone's going to give you half a million dollars out of the blue. That was a shock. Once a career kind of thing. <laughs> but it's astonishing how you can build that relationship. Our arts management work is funded by a family in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Grand Rapids, Michigan is a thousand miles from Washington, D.C. It was a woman who was on our board. She's no longer on our board. She was on our board. For six years, we built this relationship. She was a very generous person. And, and now, and, and she got more and more and more ingrained. <laughs> and last year, she gave, she committed $22.5 million to our arts management training work. Again, these are st amounts are astonishing, but it's, it, they do happen. They happen in this country as well, because I can give you lots of examples of it. And the issue is, how do you build that relationship over time? I'd rather get a dollar as a first gift and work my way up to that big gift than get $10,000 as a first gift and never see them again. Because individuals particularly are like annuities. If an individual likes you, they will stay with you forever. If they're really constantly engaged and excited, they will stay with you forever. Whereas trusts, corporations, tend to come or go. They don't necessarily stay with you forever. And governments, we see governments can go up or they can go down in their giving, but we can't count that they will be there forever at the same level. But individuals are astonishing that way. That's why I'm happy that over the last 10 years, Individual giving has gone from a relatively small portion of giving in England to now being the majority of giving to the arts in England. That's a really healthy thing. All right, number five, six is crucial. There are, I'm, I'm giving a monologue here. Any questions, comments? Yes. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, when, when you were working with your larger donor that gives you um, yes. half a million, a year. How dollars, not pounds. So yes, of course. Yes. yes. Although, yeah. Um, so that dollars would still be great. Um, <laughs> how, how much time do you, as the kind of person leading in the organization, um, commit to her? And how do you manage that? It's a manage great that? question. Yeah. It's a really wonderful question. I can't give you, a, I can't, I haven't counted the hours. So I'm, I'm not going to say it's 22.3 hours or whatever. But what I will say is this. I believe that the, that leadership of an organization, the staff of an organization, needs to communicate to every major board member, every board member, and every major donor once a month. And we do that religiously. It may be me or it may not be me. And we don't measure it like, uh-oh, it's June 3rd, time for the phone call. I don't, it, does, it happens more organically, and I'll tell you how in a second. Right? But I believe you want to have lots of communication. Sometimes it can be a pretty quick communication. With some of my donors, it's email because they're traveling around the world, and that's how they like to communicate. Others come and see me more. I'll talk a little bit about that later on as well. But I believe you want to keep communicating with people. And you want to say, oh, did you read that article? Oh, did you see that review? You want to keep that conversation going. You want to build the relationship between the person and the organization. And I'm doing that every month. 
Okay. Sure, and it's, but it's not all me, though. Yes. I would be lying if I said I, I have 30,000 donors at the Kennedy Center now. I would be lying if I said I talk to all 30,000 every month because I would go crazy. Um, and not everyone's a major donor either, obviously. But my seniors, I really believe in not just the CEO talking to donors. I like for my donors to say, boy, that head of education is really smart. Mm -hmm. I love that person who's running marketing. He's got great ideas. The woman who runs the finances, boy, she's sharp. I love that because when they, get, when they feel comfortable with my whole staff, they're also going to feel like, hmm, I can trust that group and it's not just Michael. And if Michael goes away, we're still, I still love this place and I still trust it. So, um, It doesn't, oh yeah, great. Um, so um, our artistic director, I work at Bristol Vic with Emma, is a very inspiring person that people want to spend lots of time with. Yes, so um, as we're starting to cultivate higher level donors, we're finding that a lot of people want to spend a lot of time with him mm -hmm. and not so much time with me as the development director, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which is fairly understandable. <laughs> it's quite all right. I haven't got an ego about it. Um, <laughs> so I just I wondered if you had any experience in, in how to kind of set up the relationship so there are boundaries in the first place sure. um, and then how, how to kind of pass on to other members of the team. I don't mean to sound crass at this because I don't do it exactly the way I'm about to say, but it's sort of a feeling to it. I basically say... I can have lunch or dinner with people who give above a certain level. Mm, yeah. I don't have time to do it with everybody. But I like these committees of donors because I can go and talk to 25 or 30 at a time and they all feel they've had their time with me, they can ask questions, even though I'm not having a personal meeting with each of them. That's how I limit how much time I'm spending just talking to people. But one thing I do do is I go to every performance that I can and I'm standing out there talking to people and I'm communicating with a lot of people in a very informal way, but they still feel they had their Michael time. And it might just be three minutes or five minutes before a show or interval. Um, but groups work really well, I find. Put them together. They like talking to each other. They like to know they've su they're all supporting the same thing. That also gives them confidence that they're smart to be supporting you. I don't try and keep each of my donors separate in a box. Okay? 